I think whether you're first time, second time or endless time founders, you have to remember you're always learning. If you're not always learning, don't do a startup job because there's always something that is pretty strange that will come in your way and you're always a problem solver. Welcome to Brave. Learn from Southeast Asia's best tech leaders. Build the future, learn from our past and stay human in between. No BS on success. I'm Jeremy Ao, venture capitalist, Sierra founder, Harvard MBA, science fiction nerd, and dad of two daughters. Every week, we debate startup news, interview changemakers, answer listener questions, and share personal insights. Join our movement of over 40,000 members and get transcripts, resources, and community at www.bravesea.com. Stay well and stay brave. HD Mall is a healthcare marketplace in Southeast Asia connecting patients to over 1,800 medical providers. This covers multiple categories such as dental, aesthetics, and elective surgeries. Over 300,000 patients have accessed more affordable healthcare via HD Mall. Get yourself a well-deserved health checkup. If you're in Thailand, go to hdmall.co.th. If you're in Indonesia, go to hdmall.id. Hey, Bernard. Good to have you on the show. Yes. Now I'm finally sitting on the other side of the table. The podcaster's nightmare to be the podcast guest. No, I think you have a pretty interesting setup. I actually yeah. could learn something or two from you. Yeah, and I learned quite a bit from you over the years as well. So thank you for that. Well, I'm really excited to have you on the show because, you know, I've been listening to your podcast on and off and big inspiration as well for the Asia side and obviously hung up quite a few times over the past two years. So, you know, I just wanted to kind of hear your story. So could you share a little bit about yourself? So I think the easiest way to tell my story is my name is Bernard. I, Bernard Leung, I have actually started originally as an academic. I did my PhD in theoretical physics from the Cavendish Laboratory tree, specializing in astrophysics and cosmology. Then that was probably the one in a million for me. And then after that, I went to work in machine learning in the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute, which is actually the home of the Human Genome Project. And actually recently, I caught up with a lot of my ex-colleagues there. Most of them are now in DeepMind, Google, Microsoft, OpenAI, and it's really great to be part of that team. A lot of the open source stuff has ended up in the mRNA world. So after that, I came back, worked as a scientist for a while, decided that is not the path for me. And that's when I started to be brave. That's why I've seen a lot of your podcasts and decided to go into the startup world. I did two startups. I always had to call it one and a half. And let me talk about the first one, which is the one that I crashed and burned. And I think I'll talk about later why it's one of the bravest things I did, but I will explain it later. So, so the particular startup was called Chopbot. We started off pretty well. We raised money from Joey Ito who's the former head of MIT Media Lab. We grew it almost to about 100 mil transactions, location-based advertising, except that we made some very big strategic mistakes. Some mistakes that I'm personally quite sorry for, and I did apologize to all my investors then, was we were trying to fight two wars and we were not ready to go into the US market that early. So it had actually a good revenue run rate, but I think we tried to very expand and we got killed because of short cash. That's actually the pre-grab, pre nowadays people call the ZERP era. I think if we hang on longer, Maybe we were got lucky, but I think that crash and burn experience is part of the learning journey for me as well, which I will come back to later. So the other startup, which I actually started when I came back, was SG Entrepreneurs. That was with Gwen. Gwen is probably the public face to it. I'm the other owner together with Chang as well. And I did a lot of the initial work. Eventually, I handed over to Gwen and sometime around 2014, I also assisted her in getting the sale done to Tech in Asia, which eventually ended Tech in Asia getting two very important things. They became number one in the whole region because we basically tripled their traffic. And second, they got Terrence, who's one of my protégés today in Tech in Asia. So that is a good exit because recently we have all got our money with Tech in Asia's exit to SPH. So when I crashed and burned, I just started a family and I decided that for the next startup that I'm going to build, I'm going to be the founder and CEO. So, but then I think that at that point in time, I was a co-founder, I was a CTO. And I think one of the bad things in Asia is that people typecast you. If you're a tech guy, you should be a solution architect, you should be a tech programmer. So I have to basically start my route back and try to learn how to run a proper 
a business or even be a head of a business unit as such. So I started with Vistaprint first as a product manager. Then I was about to leave Singapore and go to US to be a product manager in Amazon.com. But Wolfgang Bayer, who was the then group CEO of SingPost, came to me and said, well, you know, I can give you a better job, but maybe less than half the pay. Would you come and join me in SingPost and lead the digital transformation? Which I did. It was probably one of the best highlights of my career. So I did a couple of things. One was uh, redesigning the SAM machine, which is a national icon in Singapore, I turned it into omni-channel. That means it has this mobile app, it was webbed, and then also the kiosk itself. And the kiosk is actually ran on iPad. And I was also one of the few companies that Apple will come to visit me. And actually, I even got a chance to do the watch earlier, a watch app earlier for SingPost for Apple. We actually gone through the design phase with them. We didn't get in, but it was a very good experience working with Apple guys. So in SingPost, I did a pop station, which I think a lot of people are using. So one of the things that I really enjoyed that antenna is that whenever I walk around today, I see people using the products. I'm actually the one developed the product. With my team, the designers, the team that built it. And of course, the most uh, legendary drone flight, which I did, that gives the headline on Bloomberg, Sing Post, like Amazon test drone delivery. So with that, there was about four years. I also ran the post office business at one point. So that was when I actually have a proper PL and ran both a digital team, which is actually more a product management side, and then running the whole entire retail business for Sing Post. And also with the final project was the general post office, which you see now that's designed based on the old Fullerton building, the setup as such. Then after that, I decided that I needed a more regional experience. I was actually, because of the drone flight, I advised a lot of the post offices out there and also including the US Postal Service who actually surprisingly came to me on a on drone delivery. Airbus was also one of the people who invited me to advise to a C-suite. And then they came to me and said, hey, we're thinking of setting up a drone services set up business in Asia Pacific. Would you be interested? So oh, I said, well, I have not done an Asia pet role, so let's do it. So it was one and a half years, constantly going to China, Australia, possibly, and also to US and Europe. Because it's quite a global role. And I only spent one and a half years there. I think the only things I've done is setting up some very key strategic partnerships and also figuring out what's the strategy for China, specifically in the drone market there. Now, then that comes to the most interesting role of my life. And I think that's possibly the missing piece that I was looking for. So when you, so what people do not know, if they if you reject Amazon once, they will keep clawing back at you relentlessly. And there was always this question in my mind that, if I have joined Amazon and not Sing Post, what would be my life be? Maybe better? Maybe I have four, ten times the stock options, you know? Maybe I'm already a rich guy, but okay, that aside. But I think the more important question was, what would I have learned in an actual tech company? Because in the Sing Post role, one of the things was I was part of the C-suite team that brought the Alibaba deal to Singapore Post. There was a $300 million deal with double the market cap. You need to think of that team in Singapore that I worked for was like a startup team. We behave like a startup team. And I was the only startup guy within that team. And that was the fun part. And uh, after that, I had really great relationships with everyone. Wolfgang was very helpful in my career later on that. So Amazon came back and I decided that, well, this time around, in fact, the joke was I went to my wife and said, I signed it. You don't need to look at the contract this time. I want to do it. So I became the head of artificial intelligence and machine learning business for uh, ASEAN, which is Southeast Asia business. I did about two years and three months. I could have gone for a little bit more, except my dad was in advanced dementia. So I joined as the chief digital officer of Wahab, both the CIO and the CDO role. That was the large, one of the largest Singapore construction conglomerate. Unfortunately, he passed away <laughs> three months after that. I think I didn't regret the choice as well. And I think after two years pass, I've decided that this is finally the time. So this is the time to come back and write. I've been in that corporate wilderness part of the story for the last 12 years. So now is the time to write the comeback story. So that's where I am. And of course, one of the side projects you probably know was Analyze the Asia podcast. I think I always use that podcast to actually train my entrepreneurial muscle, like how to keep grow packing. It's, it's a side hustle, but it actually helps me to keep my startup mind alive. I think it was actually difficult if you have gone through a very long and pretty interesting corporate career. It might actually make you softer. So... I need to keep their muscles going. So Analyze Asia was part and parcel. So that's where I am. So I'm now currently working on an enterprise AI startup, which I can talk about a little bit more, but we'll go on with the conversation. There's so much to keep going. I guess me is go all the way to the beginning. Why did you 
pick that PhD in that field? Yeah, when I was 14, I read Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time. I was mm. really inspired. I want to be a theoretical physicist. I went from a very lousy student to actually manage to do that PhD in a top school. And it was quite interesting because that's a little bit like a reminiscent of a startup journey right. because I wasn't in a top school. That's number one. So when I was at my A-levels, I was actually even in Cali Junior College, which was not thought of as mm. a top school in Singapore. And one of my friends who was in a better school came and said to me, my ex former classmate said, Bernard, you're not even in the top schools. You're not in the science Olympiads. You are neither in science research program. What makes you think you can ever get to Cambridge University and do a PhD? I persisted. I found a very good teacher, a mentor. His name is Dr. Chong Siu Ming. He taught me how to read and how to think and how to really learn the whole, all the difficult math and science by itself. I, I could tell you that during my NS time, if I'm not working, I'm doing math equations. I'm trying to solve physics problems for all the first year university thing. I become sharper and sharper. It's like a daily compounding in that journey. So eventually I did made it. I made it. I did exactly what it is. I just couldn't get back for the school reunion to tell the guy who told me that this cannot be done. I made it happen. So I got the PhD that I essentially won, which was actually cosmology and astrophysics, which was what I do. And I think that for me, that was my first one in a million hit. I think under any normal circumstances, I don't think anyone would have made it. I Even I myself didn't think that at that point in time. I think that is probably one thing that I still think about on there. So that was the essential. I really enjoyed the subject. I loved it. I enjoy really working with the smartest people there. When I finished my PhD, I was thinking about how to actually apply things back more in real life as a friend of mine said, hey, you know, you, there's a human genome project down there. They need a lot of uh, people like you, theoretical physicists, because I did also need some more in economics as well. Why don't you just go and apply your craft there? And so the joke in Cambridge, when you have a theoretical physics PhD, you get a comp science PhD for free. The reason was because a lot of the work that I did in cosmology, we were using a sort of a technique called Bayesian inference, which is actually doing probability calculations and sampling. And one of the essential things that you end up learning machine learning because you need to tease out very difficult data on such. So that was where I actually picked up all my machine learning skills on there. I even did my own programs, coded it. We even tried to make a exponential algorithm to work faster. So we used the Feynman algorithm. I proposed the Feynman algorithm actually worked out because we need to negotiate with each other for distributed computing time. That was the pre-cloud days where it's not <laughs> scalable, right? And there were like seven PhD guys and I'm the postdoc and we're all in a bar and everybody is like complaining to each other. Say, Bernard, you're taking on more time because you're machine learning things. So I said, okay, why don't we all work together, figure out an algorithm to make the exponential because that's what is causing my thing not running fast enough. So I wrote out the algo. They code it, okay? It's quite interesting. They actually coded it. I, I wrote the mm -hmm. very basic one and they said, no, this is not good enough for ComScience. Why don't we help you scale it? So they scale it and we got the code, the times down, the 20, 30%. I think this is very important about innovation. It's not so much about like, it's the kind of incremental things that where you're trying to solve the fundamental foundation stuff that actually you make the biggest breakthrough. And then essentially we managed to solve all that problems on it. So yes, the academic part taught me a lot of in theoretical physics, as you will probably know from some of them, whether it's Jeff or Elon, they all are physicists by training because of first principles thinking. I think that is probably what being a physics PhD is about. And what's interesting is that after the physics PhD, you decided to go and explore, I think, two sets, right? I'll say more the technology side, mm -hmm. but also a little bit more of an entrepreneurial mindset as well. I mean, you could have become a professor, for example, right? You know, there's a common path for PhDs. What were you thinking at that point of time? Yeah, at the point in time when I decided to quit, I felt that academia is becoming commoditized in Singapore. It was really because of the influence of ASTAR and all these institutions as such. It's actually going to be very difficult. And I think they became very pro-US universities at that point in time. So the entrepreneur part was actually during one part, during when I was doing my postdoc, I was helping the Cambridge University entrepreneur to do a conference with MIT 100K. And that was where I got to meet a lot of people from Cambridge. So the Cambridge MIT Alliance from the MIT side, I worked with the MIT. T. Sloan Entrepreneurship Center and also Harvard people as well from the Kennedy School. So I started getting exposed to the entrepreneur side of it. I actually brought most of those expertise when I came back to Singapore and it was quite natural, I think, from that point. And I also did a small startup there and actually sold everything back to my co-founders because I felt if you are not fully in the game, you shouldn't be holding any equity, which is what exactly I did. And that experience taught me a lot about, you know, there's this thing called the first love problem. Like you always never forget your first love kind of thing. And because I really knew that a lot of people fail for the first time in entrepreneurship. So I was a little bit detached. So we did set up the company. It was a biotech company. But the first thing I did was I'm going back to Singapore. 
it doesn't matter. I'm not here. No skin in the game. I should be fired. And then the company went on to Series B, but I think it, it didn't continue per se. I think it sets me up ready for running the entrepreneur journey on that. And the way to think about this, don't think about the first love. Think about what would it be when you're with your soulmate. Yeah. So that means that will give you a lot more opportunity to get to that state that you want. It may not be the first company, even the second company, crash and burn, right? It could be the next company. Of course, there's only limited time. So that was why I thought this is probably the time to do it. Otherwise, I don't think I have enough time to do it. Now I have three kids and my wife is also an entrepreneur. So yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that's interesting. You have three kids. You are going to be an entrepreneur again. Your wife is also an entrepreneur. How are you feeling about that? It's tough, but you have to... First, I think the mental model should be you should never let your kids go hungry. So... <laughs> So if I need to do any site consulting projects, I'm, I'm literally currently doing consulting and teaching in the university. So no shame. Okay. If you want an example, Ryan Peterson, who is the founder of Flexpot, he was doing teaching in the university when he was creating his company. So yeah, you just have to do the side job, make the hustles happen yeah. and try to raise money and build the company. So I think all this is still the same. Your family comes first, right? I think... The other thing I started to realize is actually what is the best amount of time to dedicate to what? And I think I learned that in Amazon. So a lot of people talk about putting Amazon values, specifically frugality. The highest level of understanding the Amazon name value of frugality is not resources, it's not money. It's not trying to be poor, okay? It is actually time because you only have finite amount of time to do, to have a, there's a big demand, infinite demand that you need to. So you need to prioritize. Okay. So I try to limit it within three scope, my family, my work, my customers. So I think once you start compressing that, you start to be able to find more time to work on that. So I, I, that, that's probably the way I would think of when once you have family and you need to redo this. And over the 12 years, as I've been thinking about it, I'm also trying to work through what are the different configurations? What's the best way to sustain myself while building this, you know? They always say the startup is like a plane, you know, coming crashing and you need to rebuild a plane so that you can fly back up like James Bond, right? So, yeah. yeah so that is the probably the hardest part. Right. Of that. Yeah. And also, of course, if my wife does better, then great. You know, life is easier, but obviously it's never easy for two entrepreneurs yeah. in the house. Yeah, that's it. I mean, that's, you know, very few double entrepreneur households, right? I mean, I think, I guess there is 99 and the Asian parent. Right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. There is an Roshni you're talking about, right? Yeah. In fact, Singapore is actually have, the startups have the highest number of couples. They usually couples? in the same companies. Yeah. Or oh, in the same company. In the same company. Com company. Yeah. In, in the, the same, same company, company is very common. A lot. a lot, right? But actually two couples doing two different companies is very rare. Right, there is yeah. for, yeah. Yeah, I think for those who don't know, Yuying from SFL is my wife. So yeah. Previously a guest and, on yeah, the very podcast yeah, previous, as yeah, well. Yeah, previously a guest on the podcast as well. And I think we have decided that the only startup is the family. Yeah. Ooh, so three startups. So one each. Yeah, yeah. And in the family, we have kids, right? We want yeah, to make sure yeah. that they all do better in their lives as such, right? And I think the way we think about things Things are slightly different. We have a very different set of ways of thinking, thinking of how startups should work. So I used to make this joke. It's a joke, okay? So I always say, you all heard of HTC, the founder. It's this lady who, Taiwan's lady who ran. But what you all don't know is her husband is running another company called VIA, Very Important Architecture, which is responsible for a lot of semiconductor architecture. It's a billion dollar company as well. So I think we are not going to be, and we never think we are, a couple running the same company. So let's just each go his way. Maybe she will become more successful than me. I can be a house husband after that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, so I think this is the part, this is the difficult part yeah. of the thing. But of course, we talk a lot of the time. I find that being her advisor is easier than just going full on on it. Yeah. 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 No, I think I read this book. I think Brad Felt wrote a book about relationships and startup couples. So I remember that. And there was a time that when my wife and I were both entrepreneurs at the same time as well. And it was bonkers. But of course, no kids at that point of time. So very thankful yeah. for that. Right. They mm. see you day to day in, day out on that. But actually, sometimes your kids can be very helpful to you too. I'll tell you this really short story. And I actually, because I've been recommending people to read this book called The 38 Letters That Rockefeller Wrote to His Son. So it was actually quite weird. One of these days, my eldest daughter and my son asked me to read the book to them, the letters. So sometimes I think they were trying to help. 
because I think I was still, I'm going to start a company, but I, I really haven't locked down what I want to do. And I'm trying to think through things. So they made me read the letters. As I was reading through the letters to them, Rockefeller to his son, I read about how Rockefeller started his journey, trusting the wrong partners, making the business decision to acquire, how do he handle this competition? And I actually have a very deep understanding of Rockefeller because I read Titan, this most definitive biography. And one of the things is Rockefeller is a pretty simple man. He doesn't need to be in demon mode. He basically worked from home three times a week. Okay. This is the guy yeah. who runs the largest railway empire. If his wealth net worth today is probably 850 billion or even to a trillion. And his only thing to do is that three things, family, work, customers. So when I was reading those letters, I, I started realizing actually these are the things that this is what startup founders should be. Like. And then it started to make me really get back into the group on that. So having kids, they may see you from day to day thinking they also see their mother day to day, they are her struggles as a startup founder. So I think if you do it the right way, or maybe I was lucky that they started to make me realize it. They start, and then my eldest daughter started to be more curious and started reading Titan and all the other books. Uh, I think she's now on to the Charlie Munger book as well. So you'll find that even kids can be very helpful to how you think yeah. about being an entrepreneur. What's interesting, of course, is that a lot of folks, they're having families and they have to make the decision whether to become an entrepreneur, right? How do you think yeah. about that? Because it's not an easy trade-off, right? Like you said, you know, you have to put food on the table, you know, there's, you know, relationship negotiations. I think, when we did that, so the, the high level way I would tell everyone is do a PNL with your other half, work through the PNL and leave no expenses missed. Okay. We actually have a pretty well documented spreadsheet that we know what is the targets that we need to hit for the family, yeah. regardless of that's like the first line of defense. Then of course, savings is key. And what are the trade-offs you need to make? Trade-off could be less tuition classes, less, but then what do you have to supplement it back? Right. So like, for example, my eldest daughter, the this year is having her PSLE, right? So all right. her the resource attention is on her. How do we deploy those resources? So I think these are things that you need to think about. What are the trade-offs in a more generic way? And always the way is to try to hit the targets faster than you can. So then you don't get caught in a situation that you don't want to be in on that. Could you share a little bit more about how to go through that accounting process with your significant right. other? So I think the first thing what you need to do is you should. So what we did was we took last year's data. So mm. we're very data-driven people. Yeah. So I took the last year's data. I took all the expenses, insurance, everything as I put it all in the expenses table, like your monthly groceries, you probably already have some average number that you right. want to and plow it in, right? So you will probably get a sense of how much you're spending. Then you work on your revenues because now both of us are working as entrepreneurs, but I'm also working for side projects as well, like mm. consulting, teaching. So those are the incoming revenues. So you try to balance against that and making sure it's zero. So the key to this is to be ahead of the curve, to try to make sure that there are enough projects that will be there until you hit the milestones of your startup. I think most startups, founders have to be bear in mind that before they reach series A, B, they don't have a pretty decent salary. So there's mm. certain minimum numbers and I will just keep to the market rate. I think my wife pays herself lesser than the market rate. So the question then is how do you balance PL back and forth? And really look at it when, if you are like three months ahead and you know that you're short, you should start to figure out what to do as fast as possible. Yeah. And then what are the things that you can rinse and repeat and you can actually do better on that? But I think generically where usually things will happen is you cut costs first. It's like a startup, right? You think about it, right? You're going to be investing in building a startup. So hence, you need to do a cost cutting. Then you just do a revenue PL. So everything just goes down to being very good with your PL. I think it's something that couples should do, especially this year's PL. I went down to every number, literally. Like I actually went to check every number. I gone through all the bank statements. Yeah. I was even thinking of how to use ChatGPT to organize the thing. So I was trying a few things on it and then just test it and just try to figure out what are the things that you have to do and what are the things that you may not need to do. And then what is the next steps? So, and then of course there's a definite plan on yeah. there. And then there's, they probably just give it a try. If it doesn't work out, then what's plan B, plan C until plan Z. Yeah. Previously mentioned the first love problem in the context of startups, right? And now yeah. you've done several since then. And yeah. so you're off to build something new now. I'm kind of curious, what are you interested in? So actually it's a problem that I've encountered through both as the buy and the sell side of enterprise technology products. So let me start from the buy side when I was a CIO, CDO. 
every company out there are looking for someone like myself to do digital transformation for their companies. Technically, what they really do is you, it takes three years to get it done. And you have to have the stomach to invest in three years, right? So the first year, I have to hire the team. I have to hire a solution architect. I have to hire a programmers. I have to build maybe a programming team outside of Singapore because of the high costs here. And then subsequently, second year, you have the team. You start to manage the team, build the initial products for that. And then after the third year, everything starts to move. And then at the same time, you have to manage the legacy infrastructure. So one thing that came out after my role in Warhub, and actually we actually were much faster. And one of the things that actually made it faster was using Copilots and Code Whisperer for programmers. We hired a team in Vietnam. We put a manager who works for us, Vietnamese from us, 12 years back to Vietnam to run that team. We set up that digital development team there. And we first tested with Copilot. That's pre-GPT, just to be a, Their productivity increased by 50%. Mm -hmm. So we were able to develop apps so much faster than it was. And the deployment was great. It was what the, it's probably one of my last products that I do for a company, which we went to hockey stick growth. It was actually a very basic procurement system that goes all the way into the finance. I won't share a lot, any details about it, but the thing is actually you try to get the correct financial information at the correct time for the stakeholders. So it dawned on me that one of the other the things that happen is to deal with a lot of these enterprise software. And I would, there's a class of software called enterprise resource planning software. And if you have dealt with one of them, which is the longest version, and I shall not name names here, it is still running in, I think, a 1990s to 2000s UI interface. If you right. don't buy that particular ERP system, it's almost like you get, you will get fired for it. So, you know, the joke of you don't get fired if you are using IBM, you know, that yeah. same thing is happening. Yeah. So when ChatGPT happened, so I'm going to marry this whole digital transformation ERP question together. I realized something. I could actually speed up that digital transformation by 10x. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I could rebuild the next generation of ERP systems, or I call it business operating systems, faster, better, and customizable. Let me give you one clear problem for all ERP software, whichever company you all want to name. Problem number one, just to change a very simple workflow. Let's say Bernard to Jeremy to Adriel is one workflow, okay? Suddenly we decided that actually Bernard approves and then we want to send to either, either or to change mm. that workflow cost you at least 10K. What? And you have to pay a freaking consultant to do. And to be quite honest, when I actually privately get my solution architect to check how to do it, we didn't want to, we didn't, we actually know how to do it, but we're like, well, the CFO is not going to agree to this. So we were like, why is this so extractive? First, the license is 3K per user, 20% of your entire payment, which is almost a few hundred K dollars is on, is to pay them for support. And then on top of you, you have to pay a consultant to do this. Come on, because... you and I are in the software side, right? I built software for so many years. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. And then I started, of course, doing a lot of work on GPT actually. In fact, it actually now for me to code. Surprisingly, remember the story that I have to write the algorithm, wrote a code, and then my comm science friend say, hey, it's not scalable. Let us help you to rewrite this into a better version. I started doing a lot of those. And now suddenly yeah. realized actually chat GPT is a great coder. So the question is, so the, the high level of the idea is, can you build a next generation open business operating system that allow, that makes companies optimally efficient, improve productivity, and continuously adaptive. The continuous adaptive is what all the current ERP systems cannot do because to make one simple customization, because what they're doing is they're trying to confine you to their software framework. So all the big companies, including the ones that I used to know, some of those in local, the big ones, they are all stuck with those systems and they cannot change it. And they had a lot of technical debt. So the high level of it is to try to build it, but I'm not going to target the current ERP customers is a waste of my time. What I would like to do is focus on the small medium market, but the medium of the small medium market. And I have a counter positioning strategy to what their current business model is. As you can look behind, I actually have read the only history book of one of the ERP companies, the only history book. I actually studied a lot of their history now. So I have a better sense of how they actually made it in the first place and really thought through 
what it is. So that's the essence of what the idea is. What yeah. is the history of ERP systems? I mean, you know. Yeah, it's actually interesting because it started off with people from IBM wanted to build customized software for very specific customers in financial accounting. And this company was in Germany and they were actually getting a referrals. It was only six engineers in the company doing that. They only hit the US market only in their 10, 13 year. I mean, anybody would know which ERP company I'm talking about. But I think this is interesting. And I think recently, was it YC that actually talks about the next generation ERP that they were in one of their startup RFPs? It is an interesting problem, except that if you're not in the enterprise sales like I do, you're going to be very difficult to penetrate through. So mm. I've even thought through, I think first time founder look for product market fit, second time founder look for distribution, right? So I already have a pretty clear distribution strategy in my mind, how to sell this. So yeah. it's, so So I think it's a question of how do you think through this? Actually, I was thinking about it for a while. If anybody had read Hamilton Helmer's Seven Powers, the most powerful, the, the ERP company that I talk about, they have a power, it's called switching costs. So the question is, how do you counter position against them? So if you are a startup and you cannot counter position against the current big Goliath, you're in trouble. So the counter position can only come from not just the technology, but the business model. Which is why second time founders need to look for distribution on that. Let's talk about it because we're both serial founders, right? <laughs> so yeah, yeah we let's talk some about notes the here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what does it mean to be like you know? So you're like second time founders because of distribution. Like, what are the learnings that you have? Because you know you're a veteran, you're coming back in. I think I'm always a beginner because I I want to be yeah. very fair to everyone yeah. out there. Just because we are second time founders doesn't mean we are entitled to anything. Of course. In fact, a lot more pressure is on you. What I would say is the first time round, you try to look for product market fit. You try to build, focus a lot more on the product, less on trying to, on your customers. I think when you are a second time founder, you realize that actually you don't need to build the best technology. Right. You just need to build a good enough technology. The question, the first question you should surely ask, are there customers? Right. The answer for me is I do have customers. Basically what happened was there are CEOs of second generation, third gen, fourth gen business owners. They don't have ERP systems. They have very difficult digitization needs and all are coming to me for advice. And I started started listening to everyone and I realized actually that's what they really meant. <laughs> But you have to do it in steps and you cannot customize for everyone. And you need to figure out how to mass customize for everyone, which I believe generative AI can, except that there's still a few hoops that you need to jump. So as a second time founder, what I'll do is, okay, the technology, I've tested it. In fact, I can tell you between Gemini Cloud and Open AI's uh, GPT, which one gives the best code generation. So you have to sort of have some kind of mental model where you get your customers and you need to work backwards from your customers. How do you hit the buttons to scale? And the one thing I learned, and this is the reason why I thought that my role in Amazon fills up that missing piece I was looking for to come back to the startup. So if you have worked for any tech company, which I really urge everyone should think about, you probably have figured out how to scale a company from 50 million to 1 billion. And that is the skill that you need to get acquire. And of course, all the relationships which I do, I still have very good relationships with my Amazon colleagues. You have to, and how to, you'll be forced by very grueling targets. In fact, Amazon is like a Chinese company. It's just that it doesn't do it yet. I was under pressure just to do like how to get from zero to one million for one particular AI product. And that taught me how to prioritize and how to sell fast enough while actually the product was actually not very ready for prime time. So once you can think it that way, it will become much easier to think about distribution. So to me, the second time is actually a lot of focusing on the skills that I didn't acquire the first time. So it doesn't mean that the second time founder means that you can do. You also make the same mistakes then you'll be a third time founder. But I think for serial founders, we also need to think through how to do it. Like mm. you think of the podcast, for example, it is a second iteration of SGE, right? Where did we went wrong? But we sold. We did acquire a certain amount of audience, right? If I were to tell you that when I was telling this podcast idea to one of the notable entrepreneurs in our region and he told me, Bernard, you're not a hot chick. Your podcast will never be large. I'm serious. I have that quote Seriously? right on the... Yes. And it... And he has to end up appearing in the show. Yeah, that's so funny. <laughs> yeah, so don't, don't worry. Just because I have done the podcast doesn't mean I fight on my podcast. I can tell everyone of every 10 approaches I made on my podcast, only one come back. Those guests that you think that you can never get, I actually cold call them. I didn't even, or go through a referral. It's the same thing. What I say that when he says it helps me with my entrepreneurial muscle, it makes me a beginner. And I think whether you're first time, second time or endless time founders, 
you have to remember, you're always learning. If you're not always learning, don't do a startup job because there's always something that is pretty strange that will come in your way and then like, okay, what should I do? Yeah, you're always a problem solver. So I think when you think about it, that is like, okay, yeah, yeah, think about that. So can you believe when people tell me that it's not going to work? In fact, for the ERP, some entrepreneur, when I was just trying to formulate the idea, he just told me, I'm going to put a shot on you and you're not going to make it. Great. That was what the other two guys told me the last time round. I mean, I think there's a truth of the matter is that betting against a startup is pretty much the most probabilistically correct bet to make. You know, uh, it was funny because the drone flight that I did for, for yeah. SingPost from Pola Ubin and, and actually IMD couldn't do it and so we partnered together yeah. and they put a bet on me and, it, and they, the internal lost that bet and you know what they told me they said we thought you cannot make it for that drone flight but you know what we didn't expect Wolfgang to put an entrepreneur in front of them yeah oh. in front of CWAS <laughs> <laughs> yeah they, they, they were betting against me and we were laughing over it we popped the champagne when the flight was there but that was what they said to me they said we didn't expect Wolfgang put an entrepreneur in front of them hey. they think that CWAS will not let me fly hey. I did I caught them on an error and you know the error it was on physics yeah. first principles yeah Funny, when people say what you learn in school doesn't apply, I think it does. Do you think there's more mental self-pressure for a second or third time founder on themselves? Or is yes. it like easier? All the time. Yeah, it's like football managers, they are pressure every game, right? But you need to think of it as every game. You cannot think of it as the entire league. Yes, you want to win the Champions League, you want to win the Premier League, right? It's the same, right? Every time you go through the next cycle, it is another game. It can be in your favor, it can be stacked against you. You do not know. But what you can do is have a plan, get punched in the face, rework on the plan, and then go in again. Until, of course, it cannot be done, then you, you can call it a day, right? I think the mentality should be don't be too hung up on the first idea. I think that was actually very helpful for me. It's also part of growing up on that. I think you will be under a lot of pressure, but you should just think, okay, let's just do this. Conventionally, people are trying to find out what I'm doing in the enterprise AI space. My focus now is very simple. I just want to build a product for us, build the first deck, build the correct customer base. I don't want to fundraise so quickly. And even if I do, I will only be talking to angels who will want to back me. I don't need to go all out yet. I think what I need is to figure out, does the strategy work? Because once the strategy works, it doesn't matter. Everybody will come to you. You don't need yeah. to go to everyone. And everybody who wants you to fail will want you to fail. Everybody who wants you to succeed will want you to succeed. So you just have to make sure you have the right capability. And please don't fake credentials. It doesn't matter. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I have an actual Cambridge PhD and I work in AI, okay? Yeah. I also, just like any other people out there, I'm not going to get the VCs throwing money at me. Everybody, the best thing in startup world I like is that everybody is in equal and zero state. Fair? That's what we should be thinking in terms of second-time founders. Yeah, I agree. On that note, could you share about a time that you personally have been brave? Brave, huh? I think it's the time where we shut down Chopbox. So my co-founder and I, we had a pizza party. We invited everybody on there. And plus the fact that because I own SGE, it's going to be a public, I'm going to get hammered in the public news for failing. Then after that, of course, the news gone out and then we failed. A couple of things. The first thing I did was every investor that I, who invested in the company, whether even it's LP, I apologize to them that we failed. But you can ask Darius, actually, he was one of the investors. So through Joey's fund. I think that's important. But it cannot be something that you will hang over for the rest of your life. So that's the first thing. And you will have to deal with a lot because if you're a media person, you get a lot more public failure on that. But you just have to hang your cheek out and just do whatever it is. Do what is matters. At that point in time, I'm going to have a kid coming in another eight months time. I have to gracefully shut down the company. It took me three years to do it because of a lot of administrative things that we didn't do when we were starting a company. It taught me a pretty important lesson how to keep track of things. And when I was running Analyze Asia as a company, I actually was very disciplined with accounting, with everything else. So things that look very small to you in a startup, you develop a system to deal with it. So it took me three years on there and I was not ashamed actually. The bravest thing is of course to keep our face and meet all the former investors, former startup founders, always be an observer around. But I think after about one year plus, I moved on. Yeah, then I just thought about, I think that what is here, you have to be brave to own up that you failed, number one. I think you have to be brave about everything else. Then I didn't even know whether I will last in a corporate job. Mm. There was a bad place on me actually on yeah. that. They better said we give you two, we give you six months, and then I took the bet to twelve. 
years. Yeah. So I already won like in my <laughs> point nine 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 like based on the expectation curve. Like let me run your expectation curve. There's like they were like five years. We can give it to five years. No, <laughs> it went on and on and then recently we had a private WhatsApp group. It's like, oh my God, this 12 years. How could you do this? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, but I think you have to, I think people always talk about being brave about setting up a venture, but I think the biggest bravery I think that I ever felt, which oh, I've thought about because you asked me this question, is that is the bravery to realize when you fall and just be responsible about it. You know, I think being responsible for it is hard, right? Because there's so many reasons why failure happens. There's the environment, there's other people, there's yourself, there's investors. What do you think is the right way to define being responsible for failure? So when you fail, basically the first thing we did the response, we fired all the employees. It's something that I took it with the rest of my life. So there was once I think somewhere around 2018, I met one of the Thai engineers I fired. We took a picture together. He's actually through the experience, he became now a head engineer of a big startup in Thailand. So people who you fired, but because really that you're running out of cash, you have to come up with the remaining. We basically already know that where our burn rate is going to be. We just basically made a pretty conscious decision not to get ourselves into debt but enough to pay back suppliers, pay back your employees. So that's number one, take care of people first. Of course, going back to the investors and say you fail, that you have to own up, no choice. Some people, so the, a lot of the founders will say, oh, well, they may never back me again because of the kind of Asian culture about failure, right? I think that has changed a lot in the last 10 years. Some of the investors do ask me, hey, when are you starting a new company, right? I'm like, yeah, give me some more time, think about this shit. Now they are not, I don't know whether now I go back to them, they will even bother. I think that's the second part. And then the last part is make sure all the things you do to shut down the company. I told you it was three years, right? I probably spent probably five digits to sort out all the accounting, the whatever, and got it gracefully shut down. Yeah. So I guess, so I think the late Patrick Turner from Inset once told me, if you can gracefully shut down a company, you should put that in your CV. I think it's hard. Actually, everybody thinks that uh, starting companies is easy. Shutting down companies is even harder. Yeah. On that note, thank you so much for sharing your journey. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Let me summarize the three big takeaways. First of all, thank you so much for sharing about your early education and career. It was fascinating to hear about your experience as being inspired about space and the research of that and beating the odds to you know, do the PhD, but also explore machine learning and coding and also actually your early experiences building your first few companies. I really like the way you said it, your first love problem, you know, and how you were thoughtful about, you know, which companies you want and also which companies you eventually took on to build. Now, secondly, thank you for so sharing about ERP and what you're building. It was interesting to hear a little bit about the history of the ERP systems that, you know, most companies use today, especially when they're super large. But also I think the challenges that they face and, you know, kind of like buying, implementing and getting exploited extractively and what you you're looking to build to make this a different experience, right? Especially with the rise of ChatGPT and Microsoft Copilot. And lastly, thanks for sharing about your experience and thinking about being a serial founder. I thought it was fascinating to hear about how you compared it to being a football team manager, about how, you know, you have to think about the mental condition for every game and just taking each game as it comes. So I thought it was really fascinating to hear about different experiences, right? What's it like to build a new company again? How to negotiate with your spouse, especially when you have family and mouse to feed and about how to, you know, wind down a company gracefully as well. So these are all, I think, experiences that have become more clear over time. On that note, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me on. Thank you for listening to Brave. If you enjoyed this episode, please share the podcast with your friends and colleagues. We would also appreciate you leaving a rating or review. Head over to www.bravesea.com for member content, resources, and community. Stay well and stay brave. Stay brave.